Hi folks, my name is Sam Kuznets and welcome to the QLab Q&A live on YouTube. Uh, if this is your first time joining us at one of these QLab Q&As, welcome for the first time. If this is one of the, uh, this is not your first time, then uh, you already know the story. You don't need to listen to the next bit. That's not true. Um, the purpose of these sessions is mostly to uh, mostly to answer questions that you have about QLab. And those questions can be really small or they can be really big. Uh, and uh, they can be about audio, video, show control, MIDI, OSC, anything at all really that QLab can do is something that I'm happy to answer questions about. Uh, while we get rolling though, I'm going to um, uh, do a little bit of introductory uh, teaching about some very basic uh, things in QLab just to get folks started in case anyone listening uh, or watching is completely new to QLab. Um, those folks uh, uh, are especially welcome because this very peculiar moment in history that we're in where theaters are closed and rest like the universe is closed temporarily and this can be very challenging for a lot of folks, myself included, but it can also be an exciting time things or dig into something new. And if that's what brought you here today, then uh, I guess I just wanted to say like, that's awesome, good for you. And I'm gonna start with something introductory uh, in support of that. There should be a chat box uh, on the page. If that's true, excellent. Um, please post your questions there. And if you see me looking off camera, uh, glancing, I, which in fact you will see me doing that. The reason is I'm looking at the chat box just to make sure that, uh, just to make sure that things are working and also to read the questions that come in. And uh, of course, experiencing the highly peculiar sensation of glancing off at a chat box and seeing myself live on my own camera on the other screen. It's just, it's the nature of the beast. Um, so please use that chat box to post your questions. Um, anything at all is fair game. I will try to review the questions as I go through. If I'm in the middle of something when you post a question, I'll try to come back to it. And if I lose something off the bottom of the list and it feels like I'm floundering around for a topic and you say to yourself, hey, I asked a question, he's looking for a topic and he's not answering me, um, feel free to nudge me and remind me. That's totally fine. Um, uh, all right, so just to get started, I'm gonna um, switch to sharing my desktop. So what you should now be seeing here in the majority of the screen is uh, you're looking at my desktop, you're looking at a QLab workspace window, and then you should be seeing me uh, in a little corner. And then when I output video from QLab, it'll appear right above my head um, in, a, in its own box. Um, so that's, that's the layout of what we're doing today. Um, and look, already we have our first question. Uh, I'd love to use QLab to control my 088 desk. I use a makey makey switch to trigger QLab. Alrighty. Um, so it sounds like one of the things we'd like to talk about today, someone would like to talk about, is using QLab to control a lighting console, in this case, a 088 which is a lighting console that I think is super popular uh, worldwide. It is not super popular in my neck of the woods, uh, which is just outside New York City. So I'm actually getting uh, increasingly interested in learning more about the 088. So my answers will be a little general uh, as pertains to that console, but we'll definitely hit that topic um, first after I go through my brief intro. So for those of you who are entirely new to QLab, uh, this is a workspace window. Our documents in QLab are called workspaces. The go button is in the upper left corner. And when a queue is selected and you click go, that queue will happen. That's a, it's a sort of the most basic approach to QLab. Um, here it shows you what queue is standing by. Right now, no queue is standing by. I haven't made any queues right now. Um, this is the toolbar with buttons for each type of queue that QLab can uh, use. This is the queue list. Queues appear sequentially, top to bottom. When a queue goes, the next queue stands by and then waits for you to press go again. And then that queue goes and the next queue stands by and you wait for, wait for you to press go again. 
This area down below here, where it says no queue selected, is called the inspector, and that shows you all the attributes and details about whatever queue is selected. The sidebar shows you the different lists and carts within your workspace. A queue list, as you saw here, is any sort of sequential sequence of queues. So I'm going to select one of these lists here, and you can see I've got four queues, the toolbar, the queues menu, the toolbox, auto-targeting new queues. Those are the names of those four queues. Um, and uh, a workspace can have any number of queue lists that you like. This one has 38 lists and one cart. We'll talk about carts later on. Um, but for the purposes of um, real theater, uh, when I'm actually doing a show, I would say that I almost never have more than uh, a queue list for my queues and then maybe a separate queue list for like sound check or troubleshooting. Um, I might use other queue lists uh, during the tech rehearsal process, but by showtime, I don't tend to use lots of lists in queues, uh, in shows. Um, I see another question about redundant systems and how to go about using those. That is a great question. We'll dig into that. Um, so, uh, so thanks for asking and keep those questions coming again. Um, but just to make sure that we're all on the same starting foot, I'm going to talk about making queues in QLab, the very basic idea of how to create a queue in QLab, just to make sure. Because when I think about it, there are actually a bunch of ways to make new queues. Uh, so looking at this list of toolbar buttons here, you'll notice that if you hover your mouse over one of the toolbar buttons for just a short time, a tooltip appears telling you the name of that type of queue. So that's an audio queue, that's a mic queue, that's a video queue, and so forth. If I want to make a new audio queue, I can just click on this button, click, and it will create a new queue. Uh, a new audio queue starts off uh, broken. The red X means it's broken. And when you float your mouse over that red X, it tells you why, invalid audio file. So an audio queue needs an audio file to, in order to do anything. That's the purpose of an audio queue, to play an audio file. So with no audio file, the queue has no purpose, and thus it is broken, which um, is something I prefer not to think about in existential terms too often. I'm kidding around. Um, so I've created an audio queue just by clicking that button. Another way to create an audio queue is to click on the button and drag into the list. And then I'm still holding the mouse button down. You can see that as I drag it around, a blue line shows me where I can let go to create that new audio queue. So I've clicked, I've dragged in, and now I'm going to select the queue and type command delete in order to get rid of it because I don't want to clutter up the workspace just with these dummy queues showing you how I made them. The next way I can make a queue is going up to the queues menu, going down to audio and clicking there. So now I've got a menu, I've got the toolbar, click, toolbar drag. There's also another way to look at a list of queue options. Uh, there's the toolbar here, but if you go to the view menu and choose toolbox, you get a vertical arrangement here so I can Double click on that, which is two quick, quick clicks in quick succession. I can click and drag. And then you feel notice while the toolbox is open, and also when the queues menu is open, there are command key shortcuts for the first 10 types of queues in the list. So I could type command one on my keyboard and get another audio queue that way as well. I'm gonna get rid of all of these. I clicked on the first queue, held down the shift key, clicked on the last queue, and then command delete to get rid of them. Uh, but here's the thing. If you find that you use a type of queue very often and you would like to use a command number key shortcut for that queue, you can rearrange the order of queues in the toolbox here and the numbers stick with the first 10 queues. So let us say for, for example, that um, I were a person who liked to make my own life and the lives of people around me difficult, and as such, I have lots of time code cues. Um, for those of you who have never used time code, congratulations. For those of you who have used time code, you will understand why I'm so sour about it, and we can talk about that later. If you drag the time code queue up and up higher in the toolbox, it is now 
the keyboard shortcut number one. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sputtering. It is now the second queue in the list, which means the keyboard shortcut command one now applies to a timecode queue. So when I type command one, I get a timecode queue. This ordering belongs to this workspace. When I save this workspace, close it and reopen it, this ordering will, will stay as it is. If I make a new workspace, it will go back to the default ordering uh, that it had before, which is the same order as, uh, as the buttons in the toolbar. Okay. So those are all the different ways to create new queues, um, uh, not in counting scripting, uh, which we're not going to get into right now. Um, and I, it just sort of struck me that there's so many different ways to do it, and they're all a little tweaky and different. And for those of you who have no idea how to get started, I wanted to make sure that you realized, um, oh, no, I left one out. I left one out. I left my favorite one out. I'm going to switch over to the Finder using Command-Tab. Nope, I'm going to switch over to the Finder. <laughs> get rid of that. I'm going to find an audio queue. And I'm going to drag that audio queue into my workspace window. And look, that created an, an audio queue as well. And it already is targeting the file that I dragged in from the Finder. So even in my little speech about all the ways to create new queues, I forgot one at first. OK, but there it is. So there's all these different ways. and. Um, I want to make sure that everyone understands none of these ways is, is privileged in any particular fashion. Uh, there's none of them is the best way to create a queue. They're all just different ways for different folks who feel comfortable with different interaction with the computer to get done the same thing. So whichever one of these methods suits your fancy or whichever collection of these methods suits your fancy is, is the method or methods you should use. The other thing that I wanted to talk about uh, bef before turning to questions was the idea of queue targeting and how newly created queues can sometimes be automatically targeted. And I'm going to take a brief detour and talk about targeting for a moment. There's a, a, a central concept in QLab uh, in which um, uh, some types of queues require a target. And the target of a queue is the recipient of that queue's behavior. So an audio queue requires a target, and the target is an audio file. And what the queue does is it plays that file. A video queue requires a video file as its target. A fade queue requires another queue as its target. The purpose of a fade queue is to change parameters of some other queue over some amount of time. So if I have an audio queue um, as a I'll take, I'll create this one again. If I have an audio queue and I want to create a fade queue that targets that audio queue, after creating the fade queue, I can, I, I can either take the audio queue and drag and drop it onto the fade queue. And now I'm going to command Z for undo. I can also take the fade queue and drag and drop it onto the audio queue or command Z for undo. Or I can delete the fade queue. I can select the audio queue, and while it's selected, create the fade queue. And the fade queue starts off its life automatically targeting whatever queue was selected when you created it. Uh, and that is something that um, uh, it's not, that wasn't always true in QLab. We added that uh, along the life of QLab 4. It's one of those little things, for me anyway, that, uh, that really speeds things along. Um, it's particularly groovy. I'm going to delete it now. Uh, it's particularly groovy when there are multiple audio cues selected. So I'm going to copy and paste, and I'm going to rename these cues um, just so that you can see what's going on. It's true that those three cues are all exact copies, but I've named them different things so we can pretend that they're different things. If I select all three, which I did by holding the Shift key and typing up arrow twice so that all three were selected, I now click fade, and QLab asks me, what do you want to do here? Do you want to add three fade cues after all three selected cues? One, two, three. Do you want to add one fade cue after each, so intersperse? Or do you just want to create one fade cue with no target, and you didn't, act, didn't mean to do something clever, just make a single fade cue? The numbers along the side can be used as hotkeys. 
the button that's currently blue and highlighted with this ring will um, is linked to the enter key. So if what I want to do is add three fade cues after the last selected cue, I could type the number one or press enter and look, three fade cues targeting cues one, two, and three. I'm gonna undo that. If I wanted a different action, let's say I want to insert one fade cue after each selected two, so I could type the number two on my keyboard, boom, and now I have the three fade cues interspersed. And if I go to do uh, that kind of action again, which is to say create a fade cue while multiple cues are selected, you'll see that the last action I chose is now the default behavior. So QLab remembers which one you preferred and figures you might prefer that again. Um, so those were the those were the couple of really sort of um, introductory concepts that I wanted to explain. And kind of the main reason I wanted to explain it is something that uh, Insane Order just said in the chat. You think you know the program inside out, then Sam comes along with total basics and you still learn something new. And um, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, that's part of the reason that I like QLab as a QLab user, because even within the basic operation of the program, sometimes you can find something new and maybe that's something new will make it easier for you to use or easier to get your work done or even just more enjoyable to get your work done. So that's why I wanted to start with that. And I really appreciate uh, Insane Order and Baldrian Sector for mentioning that that's exactly uh, that, that concept because that's exactly what I was going for and what I was interested in. All right, those basic introductory uh, items uh, having been given, I'm gonna turn to the questions in the chat and what that means now is that starting now, we are not going in any particular order. We're not going to build on things necessarily. And so um, uh, you might like you might find that we jump into a topic that requires some knowledge you don't have as base knowledge. And that might prompt you to ask a question saying, can you, can you lead us to this? Can you tell me about the basic idea that led to the thing you're talking about now? That would be great. If you want to ask that question, ask that question. All righty. Um, also, I forgot to say this early on, but um, I am a, a, a jumpy, excitable New Yorker, which means sometimes I talk fast. If I am talking too fast, if I am not making sense, please do not hesitate to say in the chat, cool it, Sam, slow down, repeat yourself. I didn't understand. Your accent is weird. Any of those things, please just let me know if I'm moving either too quickly or too slowly or not speaking clearly enough, or if the stream glitched and you didn't catch something I said, or any of those things. I, I don't, don't worry, I won't feel called out. It won't feel like a problem to me. Alrighty, so questions. Um, oh, um, I'm gonna answer the last question in the chat first very briefly because it's a very brief question. Uh, Ethan uh, asked, what is QLab designed in? What programming language? And that one's just quick and easy to answer. Um, QLab is built uh, in Xcode, which is Apple's development environment, and it's written in Objective-C. I believe that there is possibly a very small amount of C or C++ inside QLab, but don't hold me to that. I'm not certain of it. Um, um, but certainly, whether or not there is, either the entirety or the vast majority of QLab is Objective-C. And then uh, some of the graphical elements of QLab, um, the Go button, uh, these icons, were all created um, in either Adobe Illustrator or Affinity Designer or some other similar vector graphics app. So quick answer. So I went out of order. But now I'm going to go back. Orphan Pixels. The first question, Orphan Pixels asked, Hey, Sam, I'd love to use QLab to control my 088 desk. I use a makey makey switch to trigger QLab. OK. Um, it seems to me that there are um, two things going on in this question. The first is you want to talk about controlling the 088 and the other is about using the makey makey switch. Uh, the makey makey switch, that couldn't mean more than one thing. So if you want to give more details about that in the chat, I invite you to, but I'll talk about controlling the 088. Um, uh, and what we're talking about here when we talk about controlling other hardware is, is show control, which my friend John Huntington describes as anytime machines belonging to two departments in a theatrical production are interlinked so that one uh, controls the other, even temporarily. He calls that show control. And uh, 
And I call that show control too, because I think it's a good definition. I beg your pardon if you hear the train. Uh, the window is open because it's, it's really quite warm and um, I live about 200 feet from the train tracks. And so sometimes I get an inadvertent train sound effect uh, going on in my live streams. Okay, so the 088. Um, the 088, I believe, accepts commands via MIDI, but if it were me in a show, so I'm gonna imagine myself in a hypothetical situation. I've been hired to do a show. I'm the associate sound designer and uh, the lighting designer says, I'm using a 088. We need to rig some triggers so that QLab can trigger the lighting console at an exact particular moment. So the first thing I'd do is go to Google and look up 088 console. Okie dokie. And it loads at whatever speed it feels like. <laughs> or it doesn't load at all. Wonder what's going on here. Well, in any case, that's what I would do first. And I would look for the manual. Um, maybe MIDI control? MIDI support in 088 support. Okay, this is looking promising. So I found a forum here, which is going to tell us about what MIDI console, MIDI, something's going on. Don't know what. Well, this is not the important part because this isn't the QLab part, but this is telling you that what I would do is I would go look up the manual of the 088 and look for the kinds of messages that it was looking to receive. The most likely um, types of messages are either going to be MIDI MIDI show control or time code. So I'm going to start by talking about um, MIDI messages. This button allows me to create a MIDI queue. And the purpose of a MIDI queue is to create and send a MIDI message. For those of you who do not know, MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And it was invented um, about 50 or 60 years ago by a group of folks uh, who decided that with the new proliferation of electronic musical instruments, what the world was going to need was a standard method for having those instruments communicate with each other. So you could buy a keyboard controller that was manufactured by Yamaha, plug it into a sound generating module that was manufactured by Roland, and they would simply work. It was a really good idea, because um, it turns out it in fact was quite necessary. And in the years since then, MIDI has been sort of co-opted uh, by other environments, such as theater, to, um, uh, to, to be used for sending messages from one kind of device to another. It doesn't really matter if they're musical or not. So if we had, say, uh, the jester's manual here, and it told us that uh, the way that you ran cues was to send a MIDI program change message, and it would say, maybe, um, set your your 088 console to use whatever MIDI channel you like. So let's say we set it to channel one. So send a program change uh, message to select a particular um, queue on the 088. Okay, fine. So we create a MIDI queue. We go to the settings tab in the inspector. The first thing we need to do is choose a MIDI destination. And what that means is where is this MIDI message going to go physically? Now, Right now, you see that I have eight options of no device because I have not set up any MIDI destinations for this workspace. So the first thing I would need to do is take my MIDI console and somewhere on it would be a, a socket for MIDI input. And uh, do I have a MIDI cable lying around here? I think I might. I think I might. Yes. So MIDI cables look like this. Uh, hopefully this is good. There's a, a lag on my stream, so I'm going to um, peek over here and make sure. Yeah. So what it is is a round connector with five little pins. And of course, like any good technology, uh, two of those five little pins are not used. They are planned for future use. Um, and I'm, I'm here in the future letting you know we never decided what to do with those two other pins. It's just like DMX. Um, any event, 
It's this five pin connector. So somewhere on the back of the 088 is gonna be a socket with those little five pins in a semicircle, and it's gonna be labeled MIDI in. You plug a MIDI cable in there, and then you need a MIDI interface plugged into your Mac, a device that attaches to the Mac and lets you send, um, send MIDI messages out. So I've got one connected uh, over here. So I'm gonna go to workspace settings, um, which is, I'm gonna close this window, which keeps getting in my way. I'm gonna go to workspace settings, which I can get to by clicking on the little gear icon in the lower right corner of the window, or I can use the keyboard shortcut command comma. And the workspace settings window has a MIDI section. And in that MIDI section is where I tell QLab, okay, here are your eight possible MIDI patches. What device do I wanna use for each? So I'm gonna to go to my iConnect Audio 4 Plus and use the DIN socket. This type of connector is called a five pin DIN connector. And I'm pretty sure, just a little historical tidbit, that the reason that the five pin DIN connector was selected by the folks who invented MIDI was that it was readily available and super inexpensive. So anyone could get them and build MIDI parts. Okay, so now MIDI patch one is connected to the, the five pin MIDI DIN output socket on my iConnect audio interface down over there on my desk. Then I'm done here. Now on my MIDI queue, I can say my destination is MIDI patch one, which now says iConnect audio four plus DIN. Great, good. What type of message am I sending? I'm sending a MIDI voice message. And in our imaginary scenario, we learned that a program change message was the type of message that we had to send. So we set the, again, the imaginary console we set to channel one. And if we wanna run Q12, we enter Q12. And now when I hit go on this queue, select the queue, you see the queue is standing by and maybe I'll say trigger LX12. Uh, I can name that queue that. So now when I hit go on this queue, a MIDI program change message on channel one sending program number 12 will go out of the iConnect Audio 4 Plus MIDI socket along the cable and into the gesture or whatever 088 console you've got. Gesture is the one that I know of the most. If that's the right message for the console, the console will do whatever it's expecting to do. It'll go on Q12. That's one possibility. Another possibility is to use another type of MIDI message called a MIDI show control message, MSC. MIDI show control messages were invented uh, in the late 1980s, I believe, with the idea being, um, all right, well, MIDI's existed for a couple of decades and we're, we're faking it. It's meant to be to hook up your keyboard to your drum machine or whatever, but we're using it for other stuff. Wouldn't it be easier if we didn't have to remember that program change did this and control change did that and all these other musical things did what we wanted them to do? So they invented MIDI show control. And when I say they, I largely mean Charlie Richmond, um, who is um, the uh, sort of, who I'll call the godfather of the MIDI show control standard. And the MIDI show control standard said, all right, well, you have this, uh, this other layout of commands rather than... Um, rather than sending a program change, control change, or note on message, you pick a command format. In this case, we're gonna pick lighting because we're talking to a lighting device. And then you pick a command, we're gonna say go. The device ID here needs to be the device ID of the device you're controlling. So somewhere on the 088 console, we would have set its device ID to, I don't know, three, and then say Q number 12. There's Q number 12, there's Q list. So I could say uh, run Q12 on Q list two. And then there's Q path, which I am almost certain nobody uses except for Charlie Richmond. So I've never ever encountered a need to use it uh, in my professional life, but that doesn't mean it's worthless. It just means I haven't run into it. Um, if you're using MIDI show control to speak with an ETC console, uh, one important tidbit is that some of the time they follow the following rule. If the queue you want to trigger is in the active queue list, leave the queue list field blank. If it's in any other queue list, a non-active queue list, fill in the queue list number. Um, so that is my nutshell summary of how to use QLab to control your 088 desk. Um, I'm sure it's not completely exhaustive, um, but that is sort of covers um, the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, so I'm going to move on down the list. 
And if anyone has follow-up questions to that, go ahead and ask them, and then we'll go there. Um, Ranjan says, could you talk about running redundant systems and how to go about it? Um, that is a great question, and I love talking about it, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. Um, so feel free to hold me to it if it seems like I've forgotten. I'm going to skip it for now. Um, uh, Ranjan also asks, does having multiple lists and carts become CPU intensive if using auto load? I've got quite a lot of script queues. And this is great. Uh, this question is great because I think that it applies to, um, it, it can be applied to a broader, a broader concept, which is um, um, about, about CPU use uh, overall in QLab. Um, so the answer is basically no. Having lots of queue lists and even having lots of queues in your workspace will not cause a performance problem of any kind uh, fundamentally. Um, you can get to very high numbers and start to see a performance problem because QLab does, um, some types of queues in QLab require um, analysis of other queues in QLab. Noticeably, light queues are aware of the other light queues in the same list. So if you have um, queue lists with if you have queue uh, workspaces with several thousand queues across dozens of queue lists, it is sometimes possible that it will have a performance impact, but it will be a small performance impact. So it's not something I think you need to worry about. Um, having lots of script queues is no big deal as long as they're not running. Script queues that aren't running take up zero processing power. In fact, almost all queues uh, take up almost no processing power all the time. And I say almost and hedge it because in, in essence, um, there's no such thing as something that has zero performance impact on a computer because the computer is running and having something uh, um, running on the computer in any way, you know, has an effect. But the, the effect of a not running queue is insitancy, insitancy. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Melissa uh, says, all I want to use QLab for my pre-show song playlist. I'm sure I'll need it for more, but I just need extreme basics. Great. Pre-show song playlist, lovely, uh, lovely, great sort of basic um, recipe type thing to talk about. So let's get into it. Um, here's how I like to do pre-show playlists. Everyone's different. And variety is the spice of life. That's what makes horse racing any other sort of platitude that I can think of, I'll think of. Um, but speaking only for myself, here is the method that I have found that I like best for creating pre-show. And uh, I'm going to start with a little tiny bit of a soapboxy design lecture because I am a sound designer by trade. Um, I am often asked about randomizing pre-show music. And my answer as a QLab person is... Yes, that can be done, no problem. But my answer as a sound designer and as a teacher of sound design is don't randomize your pre-show music. You don't want to randomize your pre-show music. And here's the reason. Your pre-show music is an opportunity to guide your audience on a, on a journey from wherever they were in their life before they walked into the theater to wherever they're going to need to be when the show starts. So whatever that is, uh, if it is a sketch comedy show with sort of um, deliberately no sort of heavy uh, intellectual impact planned, uh, what you want to do is get the audience to relax from their day life. If the show uh, is sort of a deep philosophical, um, you know, if, if you're doing no exit, right, and you, you need to put folks into this sort of like highly pensive mood, you want that takes focusing. If you're doing a period piece, you want to try to get people out of the modern mindset. Whatever it is, you're trying to put the audience somewhere. And I think one of the most powerful things that sound design can do uh, theatrically is to just drive the audience's mood or even just steer the audience's mood or just take the audience by the shoulders and point them in the direction of a mood and say, feel free to walk that way as much as you'd like. So... For me, pre-show music is my first opportunity to do that. Uh, so where's that finder window? Okay, here we go. So I'm going to go to my home folder, and I'm going to find some music. Um, so 
So uh, now what I'm not going to do is uh, waste everyone's time as I try to sort of imagine a specific play that I'm going to take you on a specific journey through. I'm just going to grab a bunch of songs and we're all going to agree that in our imagination, it's a series of carefully selected songs that does what I just talked about. Okay, great. Uh, so let's see. Um, all right, here's a Paul Simon tune. Um, here's a Patti Smith tune. Uh, here's Orchestra Zirconium. I don't know if you, anyone knows these folks. They are a big Eastern European brass band, and uh, they their music sort of high energy kind of mania in a way that I really love. Um, and uh, here's Perry and Kingsley. They just have great titles, right? Umbrellas of Sherberg. Okay, great. So let's say that these four tracks are my four um, pieces of music that are my pre-show. And let's say that I want them in this order. I already know that. Um, now, together, they make up, what, two plus three is five, plus five is 10, plus two is 12, plus almost a minute is 13, uh, 13 and three quarters, 14 and a half. Okay, so we're talking about, about 14 minutes here. And my pre-show could be you know, in this theater, uh, eight to 12 minutes long. So 14 minutes is actually not enough. So we'd want to have some more, uh, some more music just to make sure that we have enough padding. All right. So what I do next is um, I take all these cues except the last one and I set their continue mode to auto follow, all right? Auto follow means when this cue is done, automatically start playing this cue. So right now, if I were to start this cue, Gumboots, it would play, it would take two minutes, 44.83 seconds to play, and then the auto follow flag would mean that free money would automatically play next. And when that concluded, Turkish Hanga would automatically play next and so forth all the way through fever, which having no flag would not trigger another queue. Now I'm gonna make a, um, a memo queue at the bottom, which is gonna be a stand in for imaginary first queue of show. Let's cut the word imaginary so it doesn't get cut off. So this could be whatever my first cue really is, but we're just gonna have it there um, so that we can um, see what happens. So we, when I have all these cues selected, I'm gonna turn their volume all the way off so we don't hear them because we're just gonna be talking about them. Notice what happens when I hit go on this cue. This cue starts playing, its action starts counting, its post weight starts counting, but you see that my playhead is now sitting down here on first cue of show. That's because QLab has noticed that all of these cues are part of a sequence which are meant to go one after the other. This cue sequence triggers automatically. It's its own little uh, uh, stack of dominoes where you knock one over and they go tick, 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 tick. But meanwhile, QLab knows that the next thing I'm gonna be doing is triggering first cue of show. Okay, well, this is fine to start with, right? But the, the wrinkle comes when uh, I need to fade this music out early because the stage manager has gotten on headset and said, all right, house is ours. We're ready to go. Uh, we don't need to run through all the way to fever. Um, we're only going to be you know, running for another 30 seconds. So stand by to fade out the pre-show music. So what do you do? The next thing you do is you create a group queue and you set the mode of the group queue to start first child and go to next queue. If that doesn't make sense yet, fear not, it will soon. Start first child, go to next queue. Then you take all these queues and you put them inside that group. Now notice the little blue line. When it's uh, between queues, it's aligned sort of with the left edge of the text. And when the little blue line means inside the group, you see that the end of the blue line has moved over a little bit. Drop those queues in there. And now you have a group queue, which you can call pre-show music. 
if the pre-show music is above first queue of show and I select the queue and I press go, I get exactly the same behavior I had before, right? So on the one hand, you might reasonably say, why did we bother creating that group queue? It was working fine before, what have we changed? The answer is this. I can now create a fade queue and the fade queue can target the group queue. And the fade queue can set the audio levels of every queue in the group to silent and it can stop every queue in the group. So this now becomes my second queue rather than this. So when I start my pre-show music and I'm using the space bar to trigger go because that's the default shortcut. At any time while these queues are playing, I can hit go on this fade queue and it will fade out and stop any and every queue within the pre-show music group. Um, and uh, Melissa, I want to make sure that you feel as though your question has been answered. Uh, everyone, anyone is willing to add follow-on questions as well, but Melissa specifically, I'm interested in making sure that I've answered your question. This is how I create pre-show music. This is my favorite way to create pre-show music. Um, and uh, there were some follow-on questions asked sort of while I was talking about it, um, or maybe just one. Uh, Diana asked me to speak a little bit about what post weight is and what it does. Diana, I absolutely will. Give me just a second. Ethan asked, when you right click on the right side of the queue to select auto follow, can you automate it to choose auto follow on all? Oh, 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 I see. You're asking me, can I, could I set, could I select all these queues and change them all at once? The answer is I can, but it doesn't do, happen there. I go to the basics tab of the inspector with all these queues selected and I can change it here. And the reason for that, uh, that we, the choice that we made to have it work here for batch editing, but not up here, was because we thought that it was pretty possible to accidentally make a change here. And we didn't want you to accidentally make a change to a zillion queues. And we figured if you went down to the basics tab and did it here, that was hard to do by accident. So chances are, if you did it, you did it on purpose. So that's that. Um, Diana, post weight. Absolutely. We'll talk about post weight. Let's talk about it right now. I'm going to hold down option and drag this queue down here. And when I hold down option to drag a queue, it duplicates the queue. So we can experiment down here without affecting our example up above in case folks are still looking at that. I'm going to set this to do not continue. And then I'm going to create um, a wait queue that the only purpose of this wait queue will be when it goes, it counts down for one second. And the only reason we have that here is so that you can see it happen. You can see when this queue gets triggered. Okay. So this queue, Gumboots, is two minutes, 44 seconds, and 80, uh, point, two minutes and 44.83 seconds. If this queue has no continue mode, if this column is blank, there is no relationship between this queue and the following queue. Post wait, therefore, means nothing at all. Pre wait is an optional delay that uh, transpires before the queue triggers. I'm sorry, before the queue starts, but after it's triggered. So if I gave it a pre wait of three seconds and I hit go, it counts down three, two, one, and then it starts playing. That's pre wait. Post wait only means something if this is set to auto continue. And what auto continue means is when I go, the next queue goes. So if I have auto continue set and no post wait, when I press go on gumboots, oh, I'm going to add a, another memo queue below here. When I press go on gumboots, it will start and simultaneously the wait queue will also start because it's set to auto continue and there's no post wait. Got it? If I set a post wait, let's say five seconds, and select this queue and hit go, it will start, the post wait will count down, and then at the end of the post wait, the next queue gets triggered. 
all the while, the playhead is sitting down here on the queue below because it knows about that arrow, and it knows that the next queue you're going to trigger manually is this queue. If you set this queue to auto follow, the purpose of auto follow is wait till I'm done and then tell the next queue to go. So when you set it to auto follow, the post wait necessarily and automatically is the same as the duration of the queue. So I can try to change it, but it won't change because this mode forces post wait to be the same as action. So I'd love to know, Diana, if you feel like I answered your question. Um, looking in the follow-up questions, um, Baldrian mentions that pressing C is the shortcut, the keyboard shortcut to cycle the continue mode, and that's true. And I'm glad you brought that up, Baldrian. Thank you. Okie dokie. Um, Boaz has asked if I can show how to randomize the songs as well. I can, though it's complicated. Um, if I want the... This, if I want one random song to play, that's easy, right? I'm going to take all of these. I'm going to set no continue mode. So now it's just a box of cues. And I'm going to take that group cue and set it to start random child and go to next cue. Now when I trigger that cue, it picks a random cue within the group and starts that. Easy, but it only gets me one cue done. So if I wanted to randomize the order of cues, I would have to create a... Uh, a relatively complicated queue structure. And the way to do that at the moment uh, can be found on our website, on the education page, in the QLab cookbook. And let me remember where it's... Um, well, let me tell you what the cookbook is first. The QLab cookbook, which you can find at qlab.app slash cookbook, is a series of articles that lets you, um, it gives you a walkthrough on how to do some really tricky stuff. Um, it is deliberately finding the edges and the boundaries of what's possible or maybe just what's easy to do in QLab. And uh, in here somewhere is a script for randomizing a batch of cues but I cannot find it. Um, anyone who knows what this is, feel free to holler, knows where this is, feel free to holler in the, in the chat. Um, but I think actually maybe I might have brought you here for no reason because I think the, the script is not here. And in fact, what I'm thinking of is that the person who created most of these articles, whose name is Mick Poole, who is a really wonderful person and a really wonderful designer, has answered the question of randomizing pre-show music on the Google group by posting a script there. Um, so I will say for now, the answer to randomizing your pre-show music is to use this script that someone posted on the Google group. And um, uh, the way to get to the Google group, where are you? Way to get to Google group is right here. Join the QLab Google group. So if you go to qlab.app slash education, there's a link to join the QLab Google group, which is a list of many hundreds of people around the world um, who use QLab. And um, it's a lot of smart folks on there and they like to help each other. So if you have a question about QLab uh, and, you, um, and you think maybe someone asked it already, you can peruse this um, Google group history to find answers. Um, Okay, okay. So now I'm gonna go back. Um, I'm gonna go back up the chat and find the next question after Melissa's, which was about pre-show. The next question was from Insane Order. It's a question about auto load. What does auto load really do? Sometimes it seems to let video queue start more smoothly, but why? Preload to RAM? Question mark? Question mark? Okay, we'll talk about auto loading. It's a little little esoteric. Um, so uh, buckle up slightly. Computers are very fast, generally speaking, these days. Um, uh, and so um, when you have QLab uh, uh, start a queue, 
the amount of time that transpires between when you press go and when you first hear or see that cue is very small. Um, in the case of a single cue, you might find that that small amount of time is so small that you don't need to worry about the latency of it, um, the lag time. But sometimes, Let's say you have a sequence of cues, we've learned about cue sequences now, that involves lots and lots of heavy media playback. So if you're doing a, a video playback show, even if you have a big burly Mac that's got lots of processor power and lots of RAM and all kinds of goodies, um, if you have a sequence of lots and lots of video cues that all take lots of resources to play, starting them all at once can cause a delay while QLab lines up uh, all its ducks in a row and gets things going and then starts playing. QLab, um, QLab tries to take you seriously when you say if you want things simultaneously, it will do them simultaneously. And it might do them slightly late. It might shave off the beginning if it can't get there quite in time, but it's going to prioritize the actual simultaneity of it. If you preload these sequences that are very difficult, um, which you can do by selecting the queue and typing L, which loads the queue, or by setting the queue to auto load, which means that it loads whenever the queue before it is triggered. So I'm going to trigger this queue, and now this queue is standing by and loaded because it's set to auto load. Or you can use a load queue, which when it's triggered, tells another queue to load. Those are the ways to load preload something. What QLab does then is it uh, does everything it can do to prepare to play that queue or that sequence of queues. Um, it uh, opens the target file media and starts, um, uh, if you know computer programming terminology, there's a, a thread that has to get spun up to open the file. There's another thread that has to decode the data in the file. There are all these sort of like housekeeping tasks that lead to playing a queue. So QLab does as many of those as possible when you load a queue. And then, uh, and then when you press go, the actual number of instructions that need to be executed by QLab is smaller because all the loading happened already. Now, on a modern Mac, with all but the most complex sequences, the total difference in workload between running an unloaded queue and a loaded queue is so small that it is most of the time not worth your trouble to be thinking about it. So the advice, officially, the advice is this. Don't set any queues to load automatically. If you find you have uh, an unacceptable amount of lag time between pressing go and seeing the queue in action, try loading that queue in advance and see if that helps. And if it does, congratulations. Load helped. Use it. I hope that this, um, I hope that this is valuable. I hope this is a good answer. I'm going to go next. When creating a group, asks Baldrian, is there a smart way to instantly get the selected cues into the group, or is the only way to create it and then drag it into the group? I'm so glad you asked that, because just like the auto-targeting of fade cues, if you have, um, I'm going to call this queue memo, but I'm going to make a bunch of them. If you have a bunch of cues and you select them all and you create a group queue, they automatically go into the group. If you have only one queue selected and you create a group, it will not automatically insert. But if you have two or more, it will automatically insert those cues into the group. So that's the answer there. Next question is from Alex Sparks. Do you have any hot takes about Apple Silicon or Big Sur? OK, Alec, I see what you're doing here. Um, OK, here we go. Um, a couple of weeks ago now, last week, two weeks ago, time doesn't mean anything anymore, so it's impossible to say. Um, Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference took place, at which they announced the next version of Mac OS, which is called Big Sur. It's Mac OS 11. Um, and they also announced that uh, starting with the end of this year, they are going to be releasing Macs that use an Apple-designed CPU and no big deal at all. Uh, because on the one hand, for folks who do not follow tech news, for folks who use their computers to do um, to do sort of ordinary everyday tasks, what what kind of chip is driving the computer is meaningless. Just like if you just drive back and forth from your home to your work, uh, it could not possibly matter less to you who manufactured the engine inside your car. It just matters to you that it works. Um, 
But for computer ner nerds and for people who are interested in figuring out how to get the very most performance out of their Mac, this can be an interesting question. My thesis uh, about Apple Silicon is that ultimately it's going to be very good news. Um, the architecture, like the fundamental architecture design of Apple Silicon chips is uh, either is ARM or is likely to be a close relative of, of ARM, which is a family of microprocessor design. And ARM chips are faster per unit of electricity that they are fed. And critically, they are faster per unit of heat that they generate than an equivalent Intel chip. So right now my MacBook Pro has, uh, I don't even remember exactly what kind of chip is in it. I'm gonna go to about this Mac. It's got uh, an uh, Intel Core i9, that's uh, not what I was looking for, there's some serial number after that. It has a 2.4 gigahertz, eight core Intel Core i9 processor. That's a mouthful. What does it mean? It means the model of the chip is the Core i9. The Core i9 has eight computing modules in, inside it. And each of those computing modules operates at 2.4 gigahertz, which means 2.4 thousand million, 2.4 million operations per second. And when I have all eight cores doing 2.4 million operations per second, it generates some amount of heat. And that amount from, uh, from a subjective stance is quite high. If I am running Final Cut Pro on my laptop, it cannot be a laptop because my legs get burnt by it because it's generating so much heat to get this work done. The ARM processor architecture from its fundamental design bones generates less heat for more computing work. So for that reason, I'm stoked because the laptop's gonna run cooler, but also less waste heat means less electricity had to go in in the first place, which means my battery lasts longer. But also it means less waste heat means that the performance of the computer can get higher without running into a limit of too much heat to get rid of. So I'm stoked about it for that reason. Big Sur, I have a cautious um, optimism for. I have a cautious optimism for every version of Mac OS. Every version of Mac OS might be the version when they leave behind something that sucked and embrace something new that's awesome. But the trouble is every Mac OS version might be the time that they leave behind something that was awesome and embrace something new that sucks. And we won't know until we see it. So I'm kind of neutral on Big Sur at the moment. Um, but I think Apple Silicon ultimately is gonna result in some way fast Macs, some way powerful Macs, and I'm really stoked about that. Uh, Insane Order asks me, do you have experience building a Hackintosh specifically for use for QLab? This is easy. I do not have experience building a Hackintosh. I do not have any problem with Hackintoshes. I don't have any ethical objection to Hackintoshes, but I will tell you this, I don't use Hackintoshes for QLab and neither should you. Uh, part of the reason that QLab is so stable is because we uh, can test it on a produ predictable range of Mac OS hardware and because the Mac OS itself knows what kind of hardware it's going to be running on. And once you break that assumption, you open the door to unknown quantities. So I'm not saying you can't run QLab on a Hackintosh. I'm simply saying that if you do, uh, you open the door to unpredictableness and you open the door to problems that we won't have encountered or have thought about and that we can't help you with. So we do not support running QLab on Hackintoshes. That said, uh, when you're not running it on a show, when it's just you know uh, for, for learning or for, for preemptive work, I, I don't really see a problem with it, um, but it's, um, you know, it, it, it can get dicey and in unexpected ways. Okay, uh, da, 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 Script, logic, grouping, great. I'm trying to find questions. Um, scare says, scare, scur, says it would be great to have a clock and preferably a show clock in QLab. Any chance of doing that or is there any way of doing it? Well, there is one way to do it by hand, which is pretty easy, which is to create a wait queue and set its duration to some number that is definitely longer than your show. So if I have a show that runs two hours, I could set this wait queue to run for 10 hours. And then I could create a start queue that targets it and a pause queue that targets it and call this top of show and call this 
end of show. And now when I'm at the um, top of show, I hit this and it starts the wait queue. And then whenever I get to the end of my show, I run this queue and it pauses the wait queue and then I can see exactly how long my show was. In this case, it was 6.3 uh, 6 seconds. Not terribly long. It's not, you know, the most flexible show clock in the world, but it's not bad. I will also point you to a, uh, a chapter of the QLab cookbook called Captain Slog, which goes into some more detailed ways to do that. And then I will also say, Scare, that that question has been asked us before, and we have added uh, that question to our list of ideas to consider for the future. I am always excited to add to that list. I want you to understand that there's 1,200 things on that list right now, 12 to 1,300. And so when any one individual item makes it into QLab is hard to guess. But I assure you that um, everything that people ask us to do either goes on that list or we write back saying why we didn't put it on. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, um, person whose name is in Cyrillic, and therefore I do not know how to pronounce it, and I apologize, um, asks, is there any way to reverse time in MIDI or linear time code? Um, and I believe that the answer is no, and I think that that is, um, is built in inherently to the concept of time code. I don't believe that you can run time code backwards and expect anything proper to happen. Um, so I don't think that that's possible. Um, okay, going back to the question list. Um, Desired Effect said, can you talk a little bit about the best practice for folder structure and bundling? The root folder system from way back in QLab 1 always made sense to me. I know what you're saying. The root folder structure in QLab 1 always made sense to me too. Um, and lucky for you and me, the best way to structure your media for a QLab project is to emulate that root folder structure by hand. This is one of my favorite topics. Um, so here's how I do it. I'm gonna go to the finder and create a new window. Okay. Um, let's say uh, that I am working on a show. Um, my show, oop, show. Okay, so here's a folder for my show. What I do is, uh, let's pretend that I'm doing sound and projection design just to keep things as complicated as possible. So what I do is create a, sh a folder called my show, the name of the actual show, a folder inside it called audio, a folder inside it called video, and then I save my QLab workspace I'm going to make a new workspace. I'm going to save it as my show. Inside there. So now I have my QLab workspace, an audio folder, and a video folder. Inside the audio folder, I put all my audio files. And crucially, I put the file in that folder before I put the file into QLab in any way, right? So I first organize my audio. If I want to do subfolders, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I'm a wild and crazy guy. Uh, maybe I'll do subfolders. Weather, music, scary sounds, right? Maybe I'll have subfolders. Doesn't matter. In my video, maybe I'll have subfolders, maybe not. Then I just follow this rule. Material goes into these folders first, then goes into my show second. That's rule number one. Rule number two, if I want to move my show to another Mac or to another place on my Mac, thing one, quit QLab. All right, we're going to not fully quit QLab because this workspace takes a long time to reopen, but I'm going to close my workspace. So thing one, quit QLab. Thing two, Move my show. Do not move anything from within this folder. Move this folder. I can copy it to another disk. I can move it to a different place on my Mac. When it reopens, the relationship between your QLab file and all the media inside 
will be the same relative to the folder. Looking from inside the folder, everything's still where it was. It's just that outside the My Show folder, things have changed. If you do that, you never need to bundle. You never need to worry about manually managing your media at all. That's the way that I like to do it, and that is the way that I recommend it. Bundling, which you can do by going to the File menu and choose Bundle Workspace. Bundling makes a copy of your workspace and a copy of all your media and generates, oops, and generates this folder structure automatically. So it creates an audio folder with audio, a video folder with video, and your file. And then it creates all that inside a, uh, an enclosing folder, which you can then move around by hand. Bundling does nothing else except manually do this process that I just described how, to, how I do it. So you can bundle after the fact, or you can do what I do before the fact. And uh, I encourage forgetting about bundling and, and just starting with organizing your media before dropping it into QLab. So that's my answer. Um, desired effects that I love that it let me have multiple versioned workspaces referencing the same assets. Right. So if I want to have multiple versions, I can just duplicate. And away I go. Piece of cake. No problem. The other thing that's critical is if you want to change your assets, Right? If you want to rename a folder, uh, a file in here, or if you want to uh, move things around in different folders, just do it while QLab is open, because then QLab can track the change as it happens. If you want to move the whole folder, do that while QLab is closed. Okay. Does QLab still auto relink assets starting from the path of the workspace if your folder structure is the same? The answer is yes. Okay, Maru asks, when using QLab during a show, do you disconnect the internet? I was told that possible updates could appear and damage the project. The answer, Maru, is not that simple, unfortunately. Um, the short answer is, I do not advocate for disconnecting from the internet just as a matter of course. I do recommend the following. I go uh, to System Preferences. And I go to software update and I turn off automatically keep my Mac up to date. I go to app store and uh, to preferences and I turn off automatic updates. Those are the things that I recommend doing for sure. And then the next thing depends on exactly how you stash files on your, on your show Mac. If you keep files, uh, you shouldn't keep show files in Dropbox, Google Drive, or any other automatically synchronized folder, ever. And the reason for that is because uh, Dropbox could remove folders out from under, uh, remove files out from underneath you. Google Drive does it too, and even worse. So if your Mac is online, and your files are, and, and your show file is inside Dropbox you're allowing Dropbox to sort of have control over what happens in that folder. And that's what I don't recommend. So it's okay to keep the Mac online and it's okay to keep the files in Dropbox, but not both at once. And also like, don't keep the files in Dropbox, just copy out of Dropbox in and out. Okie dokie. Um, the same individual with a Cyrillic name asks, is it possible to make a mirror between two Mac Pros through the network using one keyboard and one mouse for two devices at the same time? The answer to that, I believe, is no. Um, um, but if I may get a little cheeky and say, I think I know what you're really getting at, which is what you want to do is have a main Mac and a backup Mac and have them hooked together so that you don't need to manually manage your backup Mac all the time. And... Um, that is something we understand is a, an issue, and it's something we're working on, and it's something that I hope we will have an interesting answer for soon, but I'm not prepared to talk about it now. Um, but it does remind me of the earlier question from the, from the very top of the chat to talk about redundant systems, and we'll get to that real soon, um, because it, it really is a good one, a good question. 
Ethan's asked, does figure 53 hire software developers? If not, what's the reason for not hiring? The answer is we, uh, the reason for not hiring is we, uh, we, we don't need more developers right now. Um, the same reason every company doesn't hire folks all the time is as you hire people, it, you have to pay them. And uh, unless the uh, income of the company is going up too, that becomes untenable quickly. We are a small team and we uh, increase the size of the team when we need to, and we do it cautiously. Um, right now we have about 15 folks. And uh, as of course, you know, uh, we're at a strange moment in the uh, uh, the world for lots of reasons. Among those reasons, uh, economically speaking, uh, there's lots of uncertainty, and and of course, fewer folks buy Q Lab when there's a global pandemic and no theater happening. So we're certainly not going to be hiring folks right now. Um, but the time could come, and uh, when that happens, we have a a link on our company website, figure53.com. Uh, we always post jobs there, and we post jobs on Twitter. Uh, we, we post job openings on Twitter, um, but it does not happen often. So that's the answer. Again, a slightly cheeky at the beginning, and I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, Insane Order says, do you have a ballpark date for QLab 5? Like, is it more close to 2021 or more close to 2023? Uh, I think it's pretty, uh, pretty clever of you to give me that particular range of options to answer. I will say, I do not have a ballpark date for QLab 5. Here are the things I can say about QLab 5 that I know are definitely true. And those are the only things I like to say about something that doesn't exist yet. What's definitely true is QLab 5 is actively being developed and the whole uh, programming team is working on QLab 5 proactively right now and has been for some time. Um, we're making good progress, and our hope is um, that we are um, a number of, probably a large number, but still a number of months away from a, from a private beta test, not a number of years away from a private beta test. Now, having said that, over the history of QLab, the time between the first private beta release and the public release has been wildly variable. So if we were one year away from a private beta, which I'm not saying we are, I do not know that. If I knew it, I would answer that I knew it, but I do not know that yet. We are currently in the space where we're like, we're gonna work until it feels like it's time to set a deadline and then we're gonna go. So if we were a year away from a private beta, we could be anywhere from uh, from that beta, it could be another six months, it could be another nine months, it could be another year, it could be another two years. We don't know for sure because we don't know how the beta test will go. We don't know whether, for example, we might say, check out this new feature. And our beta team says, that feature is great, but it's only going to be really useful if you add this other feature. And then we say, all right, well, we think we could do that. And we think it's worth it, but it's going to take nine months to build. So that's why we don't like to talk about timelines, right? Because there are unexpected pressures that can affect the timeline. Um, we, are, we, are, we are hacking away on QLab 5 fast and energetically and enthusiastically right now. And, um, and we would like it to come as soon as possible. But um, I'm not going to, to take a guess at a date because it is not yet time to have an educated guess. And I don't want to sound like a dummy and end up being wildly wrong. Um, okie dokie. Um, we're going to talk about redundant systems now. Uh, this was Ranjan's question from the beginning of the class. And then also, um, our Cyrillic named friend, um, a little later on. And, um, so we're going to talk about redundancy and this is in my workspace and you should see, I believe above my head, uh, yeah, a message from the redundancy department of redundancy. So how to run a redundant QLab system. The first thing you need to make sure now, is this going to, I don't know if this is going to be too small, um, to be usefully legible. If it is too small to be legible, then at least, at least we can use the, uh, the shapes, um, 
to be to be productive. Um, the idea here is that um, to run a redundant QLab system, you need to take uh, a source of control input, which is your operator who's running QLab, their fingers, and you need to feed it to two Macs, which are both running identical copies of your workspace. And then you need to take the output of those two Macs and somewhere in between those Macs and the rest of your system have some method of switching between the two. That's generally accepted as the best way to do, uh, to do a redundant system. So um, I'm going to start for a moment by talking about the input side, and I'm going to um, point out this piece of hardware. This is a go box, and here's my disclosure. I build these, and it's a side hustle. It's not part of figure 53. Figure 53 does not endorse these officially. Um, it also doesn't anti-endorse them, whatever that word really should be. Um, but this is also not the only way to do it. It's just the one that I have because it's the one that I build. But what this device is, is a series of buttons, two USB connections. And each of those USB connections can be plugged in to a Mac. And when I press any of these buttons, the same MIDI message is sent to both Macs at the same time. This model, um, uh, made by me, uh, is um, you can find at teamsound.nyc. There's another uh, popular one called the Q Widget, which is made by a company called Widgeteering, and I don't know their website address off the top of my head. You can look at um, at the Go Box. You can look at the Q Widget and see essentially that they're just somewhat different physical designs for the same basic idea. Press a button here, both Macs get the same message. So what you do is you take two Macs, you put a copy of your workspace, which you now know how to move from Mac to Mac because we just talked about folder structure, put a copy on both Macs, open it on both Macs, make sure that it's standing by the first queue on both Macs, plug in a box like this, and then make sure in workspace settings, I'm going to close this other workspace so that I don't confuse myself. In workspace settings, go to MIDI controls and make sure that use musical MIDI controls is on and make sure that the MIDI messages that the box generates are being used to run the show. So here, uh, note one, which is what the green button sends, note one sends a go. So when I press note one, QLab goes as though I hit the space bar. Since I have two Macs plugged in, not right now, but in, in this story, pressing go here makes both Macs go. OK. The main Mac, let's say I'm doing audio, the main Mac has its audio routed into the sound console, its channels unmuted, and the output sent to speaker so you can hear the cues. Meanwhile, the backup Mac, the B Mac, is plugged into the audio console but muted. And so you don't hear its cues. If I have some cat, uh, catastrophe during the show and my A Mac goes down, I can just reach over to the console, mute the A Mac, unmute the B Mac, and keep pressing the same button I was pressing all along, and the cues will continue to go, and the B Mac will already be right where I was. Um, uh, this device cannot be a mouse or keyboard because there is no such thing as a mouse or keyboard that plugs into two computers at the same time and sends them the exact same messages at the exact same time and always works. I've seen weird keyboards that purport to do this. They do not always work. So that's why you need something like this. It doesn't have to be this. It could be a regular MIDI device of any kind and then a MIDI splitter, which is um, uh, a company called MIDI Solutions makes the best one, in my opinion. It's a little box. It's got a MIDI input on one side, a MIDI output on two sides, and it's simple. Whatever message comes in here goes out both of here. So if you have a MIDI drum pad that you like, you can whack one for go. Just plug that into the MIDI, uh, the MIDI splitter, and it goes out to both Macs, and there you are. Um, Redundant systems are particularly challenging for video folks because switching the output between the A Mac and the B Mac, the main and the backup, um, requires a video switcher often, and those tend to be expensive. <clears throat> so that's, um, that's a little vexing. Um, I'm hoping um, that if any folks have, 
we're, we're following along that redundant question, redundant system question and have questions, follow up questions for it that they will please post. Um, uh, Josh just mentioned, I've also built redundant systems using network queues. Um, uh, and Josh, I'm assuming what you mean is that the primary queue uses, the primary Mac uses network queues to trigger the backup Mac. And while that can be okay, it has the flaw of uh, a crash on the main Mac means your backup Mac goes down too, or not goes down, but is not up to date. Um, I'm not saying it's a disaster, uh, but I think that one of the most important things that you should do when you're working on a redundant setup um, uh, is to really think about all the kinds of failures you might encounter and then imagine that you've encountered that failure and then say, does my system help me if that failure is what occurs? Does it get in my way? Does it have an unpredictable effect? Does it have an effect that I hadn't thought about? Um, all backup systems are a matter of risk management, right? Like very few shows, um, very few shows have um, spare speakers hung just in case the speaker gets blown out. Right, because we've gotten to a place in our history where speaker failure is unlikely to happen uh, without a specific cause. Um, likewise, lots of shows might have a spare audio console nearby, but very few of them have a spare audio console fully patched and ready to switch in at any moment. So there are different devices, uh, there are different parts of a sound system or a video system or a lighting system that we've sort of decided the failure of that device is is so uncommon, I'm not going to worry about it. Or the thing that would go wrong if that device fails is not such a big deal, I can fix it at intermission. Um, so I encourage people, whenever they're thinking about redundancy and backups, to just always ask themselves those questions. How likely is this to fail? What kind of a problem would it be if it did fail? And does my backup system protect me against that kind of failure? Um, insane order asks, can someone like us join the private beta testing team? Um, theoretically, yes. Uh, and, um, I will say only this, we don't always need a bigger beta testing team than we've got. And, um, when we need more beta testers, we put calls out on the Google group. Uh, the QLab Google group, you'll, you'll see me post asking for folks who want to join the beta. Um, if you have a particularly um, unusual use case, if you use QLab in an unusual situation or what you feel is an unusual situation, or if you feel like you have some kind of specific um, setup or knowledge or experience that you think maybe uh, we need better, a better understanding of, I encourage you to write to us, support at figure53.com, and, um, and tell us about it and say that you might like to be on the beta team. I will say this, the one thing we know for sure we would like a little bit more help beta testing is accessibility of QLab for the blind and visually impaired. We have three uh, blind or visually impaired uh, QLab users and I'd like to increase that team slightly. So if you fall into that category, uh, please do get a hold of us. But if you can use that as an example of the kinds of specificity that we might be interested in, um, please write to us. Um, I, can't, I can't promise anything. Um, generally, there is a maximum viable size for a beta team, and, um, and we're close to it, in my opinion. But uh, you never know. You never know. Um, uh, William has a follow-up on output switching. I just use splitters and a simple A-B switch on my HDMI outputs. It rolls, but it takes over the job. Exactly. Um, I think a lot of people spend a little bit too much time and energy sort of trying to rig their redundant system to be able to switch seamlessly and perfectly over. Uh, in my opinion, for, um, for, for, for live theater, seamless switching is generally a waste of energy. And here's why. There's only two situations in which you switch from your main QLab system to your backup QLab system. Situation number one, you have a problem that you notice, that the audience notices, and you decide to make a switch. In that case, a seamless switchover is pointless because the seamlessness is already gone. Situation number two, you anticipate a problem. You see a problem might be about to happen. 
so you can choose when to switch over. So choose to switch over between queues. Then seamless switch over is unnecessary because no queue is running, so you don't need seamlessness. So, uh, so William's solution of just sort of having some kind of basic switch that lets them flip between one or the other is a good way to roll. Um, Ranjan talks about using Stream Deck and Companion to trigger both computers. Um, that's getting increasingly popular. Of course, Stream Deck Companion has to run on a third computer in order for it to be truly bulletproof against the possibility of either computer falling down. Uh, or I think some people are doing Stream Deck Companion on a Raspberry Pi or something like Stream Deck Companion. If that works for you, that's great. It's a good solution. As long as the primary Mac and the backup Mac are not directly communicating, you don't have to worry about one coming down and affecting the other. And so as long as your control structure sits back here and talks to both of them and they don't talk to each other, you're good. Um, Scott reminds that it is important to make sure your backup and main Macs have the same, uh, have balanced levels. Balanced. So if you have a audio console and you're routing both main backup Mac into an audio console, just make sure that the same queue on each runs at the same loudness. Absolutely important. Absolutely important. Um, um, Baldrian asks, with a list of 1,200 things to improve or add to QLab, how do you prioritize what you work on? Do you have some main features you can mention that you're working on improving? We don't really like to talk about features that haven't been released, and there's a couple of reasons for that. But the main one is, um, because of the nature of software development, the only time you can know for sure that a feature is working is once you've released it. And you can be pretty comp comp pretty confident uh, through testing, but um, we, uh, we have an example we like to point to about why we don't talk about unannounced features. Um, QLab 3 and QLab 4 have the ability to use audio unit uh, effects live on an audio queue or a mic queue. That feature was originally built for QLab 2, but during the beta testing process, it was um, discovered that it introduced some unpredictable problems and there was some instability caused. So not at the last minute, but certainly within the beta process and not on day one, uh, the ability to use audio units was removed from QLab 2 in order to make sure that the first release of QLab 2 was completely stable or as stable as it can be. Um, and that is a feature that if we'd been talking about it in public, would have really come as a major disappointment. So we do not, um, so we do not like to talk about features uh, in specific. Um, but the answer I can talk about how we prioritize, which is um, we use a number of different sort of imaginary levers to push up or down the priority list. One of them is whether or not a feature seems technically feasible in a reasonable amount of time. So for instance, if we are, uh, we have QLab 4.6 released right now. If we weren't working on QLab 5, we would be preparing for QLab 4.7. And we would like to try between 4.6 or 0.7, any point release like that. We like to aim for sort of a, a manageable chunk of time to work on it, six weeks, eight weeks for main feature development, something like that. So if someone proposes a feature that we think can't be achieved in eight weeks, then we'll shelve it until we can put more folks on the problem at once or whether we can decide to deliberately have a longer development window uh, or something like that. So that's one pressure. Another kind of pressure is um, many of the folks inside Figure 53 are theater professionals and uh, uh, we all have various disciplines. There are writers in our group, composers, there are teachers in our group, there are designers, there are actors, there are directors. And um, this group of folks, as we make theater in our own various situations, have an opportunity to see QLab in action uh, sort of with a different, uh, different mindset. And sometimes we realize, oh gosh, you know what? If we had feature X, it would completely solve this problem we're having in tech right now that's making everyone so frustrated. So that's something that can push something up the list. Um, another thing that can push something up the list is when more people write in and ask for it. Um, so here's an example of a feature I'm willing 
to talk about. We are exploring adding NDI video input and output to QLab. We're exploring it. I am definitely not sure whether NDI uh, will make it into the next release of QLab, but I am. we are learning about NDI. And the reason that NDI made it on the list is because NDI, I believe, is now the most requested video feature in like, yeah, in like the last several years. So the squeaky wheel to a certain degree gets the grease, um, but not only. So that's just another up or down pushing lever. Um, I closed a feature request uh, issue um, a couple of days ago that someone sort of wrote a passionate uh, request about a specific feature. I really love it if QLab did this. I think it's utterly critical. I absolutely need it. Um, and that request came to us in 2013 and no one else has mentioned it since 2013. And uh, so that one I decided could fall off the bottom of the list. Um, anyway, so I hope that that answers that question. Um, Boaz asks, is the redundant way to work with Dante primary and secondary? If the primary stops working in the backup Mac can use the secondary. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. And I'm gonna take a sip of water and then I'm gonna talk about it more. You'd think if it were this humid, your mouth wouldn't get dry, but that is not true. Okay, Dante primary and secondary and a primary and secondary Mac are two separate concepts. For those who do not know, I will explain very briefly what Dante is, and then I will explain how Dante primary and secondary works, and then I will explain how to do redundant QLab playback in a Dante situation. Dante is a uh, digital audio networking system. It's made by a company called Audinate, and um, it's very flexible. It's very easy to deploy. Uh, it doesn't require a lot of super fancy equipment. Um, and its sound quality is stellar. And critically, it has completely predictable latency. So when you have a Dante system set up, you can determine through the Dante system exactly how much time it will take for audio to reach po from point A to point B within the digital portion of your sound system. And that makes it really easy to set up the rest of the sound system to sound good. Dante uses, um, uh, uses uh, what looks like ethernet networking. And in fact, it, it is a kind of ethernet networking. So you can use uh, just regular ethernet switches that you get at any store, they have to have certain qualities to make them most appropriate for Dante use, but it's not only the very special highest end switches that work for Dante. You use regular Cat5e uh, network cable, no, no fancy cable. Lots of audio devices that use Dante have two Dante ports, a primary and a secondary. And the only purpose of the primary and secondary Dante ports is if one of the two uh, signal paths physically breaks. So in the simplest system, I have an audio console over here. I have um, an amplifier over here. The console can send Dante out. The amplifier can take Dante in. They both have primary and secondary ports. So I run two network cables from one to the other. I start playing audio from the console. I get it at the amplifier. Everything's great. And then someone comes along with a forklift and drives over my network cable and crushes the primary cable. Dante automatically and instantly switches over to the backup, the secondary, and you should theoretically experience no drop in audio. For this to work, of course, you have to make sure that your primary and secondary Dante cables go different physical paths so that the same forklift doesn't also crush the secondary cable. That's an important thing that I think a lot of people can easily gloss over. Uh, if that's the kind of problem you're looking to avoid. If the problem you're looking to avoid is simply wear and tear on the cable causing the cable to be flaky, then you can run them side by side, no problem. That's Dante primary and secondary. The trouble is that uh, they have to be coming from the same machine. And so you either have to have a Mac that takes PCI card slots and use a Dante PCI card that has a primary and secondary output, or you have to be using recent versions of Dante on a Mac Pro which has dual uh, network jacks, and then you can use those two as your primary and secondary Dante outputs on one Mac. If you want to have a redundant Dante system, you need two Macs, both running Dante into a switch, 
the uh, network switch. The network switch feeds the Dante into, say, your console, and then you have to use mute groups or whatever to flick back and forth on the uh, on the console. Or you can use uh, uh, scenes on the console to have different Dante inputs active um, at different times. Um, but unfortunately, Dante primary and secondary cannot be like co-opted uh, to be part of a, a redundant QLab rig where the primary is one Mac and the secondary is the other. Blind Door Studio says, as a performance artist, can I trigger my individual cues via MIDI with musical instruments like a MIDI guitar or a keyboard? Sorry for the strange question, but I'm new here. Thanks. Blind Door Studio, it is not a strange question, um, but since you're new here, you didn't know that yet. So, first of all, it is not a strange question. Second of all, even if it were a strange question, it would warrant no apology, because I love strange questions. Uh, and thirdly, welcome. And fourthly, the answer is yes. I'm going to talk about MIDI triggers now. Um, and uh, let's do that in, a, in, in this workspace, in this uh, queue list. So I'm going to create a new uh, wait queue. And again, the only reason I'm going to create a wait queue is so that when it triggers, you can see it that something happened. When I have a queue selected, I go to the Triggers tab, and the Triggers tab allows me to cause this queue to start using a number of other methods besides pressing the Go button. One of those methods is a MIDI trigger. So I can tell this queue, listen, when you receive a note on message on any MIDI channel, uh, note five, velocity three, or velocity greater than four, or velocity less than 128, I'm sorry, uh, less than 110, or any velocity, play this cue. Alternately, I can pick a button on my MIDI transmitting device, press capture, and then press that button and QLab will capture the note I pressed and the velocity I pressed it at. Um, so now, whenever I press that button, this cue happens. I could send other kinds of messages. I can also trigger that same cue with a hot key, which is any key on my keyboard. So I could assign the cue, the letter F. Uh, no, that's actually, that's in use by the workspace. So I could assign the letter G and whenever I press G on my keyboard, that cue happens. If I wanted it to only happen when the shift key is down, I could press sh I could click in here and press shift G, and now only shift G would trigger this cue. But the original question was about MIDI triggers, and so you could have a musical instrument hooked up to your Mac, and whenever you send a particular note on or note off or program change, control change, key pressure or channel pressure, an individual cue could be triggered. Josh asks, I work a lot in corporate shows where shows change by the minute and VIPs really don't want to see even the most minor of glitches. Okie dokie. Um, to that I say, in a corporate environment, you can afford a extraordinarily expensive video switcher that does seamless switching, uh, hopefully. So that's one solution. Another solution is to structure your show in such a way that a failure uh, during a queue could result in you, for example, using your external video switcher to dip out to a backup image that's always up while you switched over to your Mac and then seamlessly cross-faded back. Um, I, I was being a little flippant before when I said seamless switching is often unnecessary, unnecessary to think about. What I really mean is not that seamless switching isn't important, but what I really mean is that seamless switching in the context of having a redundant QLab system whose purpose is to recover from a, like, a show-stopping failure on your main Mac, in that exact contents, seamless switching is often irrelevant because the only reason you would switch from the main to the backup is if you already had a noticeable problem. That's all I'm saying about that. Um, no, no, no says, I'd love to use my Aja IO Thunderbolt video device. Any chance to get Aja devices working on QLab? We've had a few requests for Aja devices. Um, here's the problem. 
AJA requires us to sign a non-disclosure agreement before we can even learn whether or not their systems could be compatible with QLab. And uh, we have a philosophical disagreement with that. We don't think um, that a non-disclosure agreement, uh, well, we don't think non-disclosure agreements are necessary almost any time. Whenever we are asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement for any reason, we respond by saying, how about I simply promise not to tell your secrets and you promise not to tell mine? And most of the time that that's, that's enough. But Aja just has sort of a faceless corporate wall that says, you want to incorporate our hardware into your software, sign this form first, then we'll talk. And um, we don't really like how that feels. Um, I'm not saying we'd never do it. If there is an overwhelming level of interest in Aja hardware for QLab um, uh, and people write in, I, I'll never say never. But right now we support Blackmagic hardware because their software does not require a, a non-disclosure agreement and it's it's actually pretty easy to incorporate. Although we're finding um, that we're gonna have a little bit of a trick making Blackmagic video compatible with Big Sur, but we think it's possible. It's just gonna take some time to figure out. Um, but for now, Blackmagic sort of solves that need and Aja is like, cool, um, but doesn't like right now fill a niche that is unfillable otherwise. And Josh says, wasn't so much of a question, just a commentary on redundancy. Josh, totally. I totally hear you. I'm not like, um, I'm, I'm not trying to disagree with you. Um, I'm just trying to sort of explore the topic uh, writ large. That's all. Um, Rajan says, what is a MIDI file queue? Great, great question. And someone else actually earlier asked about um, preferences and MIDI patching and what what's the story there with MIDI versus MIDI file. So this is sort of two questions at once. Huzzah. Um, a MIDI file queue, which is created by this uh, icon here, I'll click it and show you the settings tab. It shows this sort of vague space, but um, I can open a folder where I know I happen to have a MIDI file. It's in here somewhere. Yeah. So this is a MIDI file. It's the Can Canadian National Anthem as a, uh, a standard .mid MIDI file, which is a, a file type that is not our file type. Um, but it creates two tracks here, the voice track and the piano track, and these are notes. The width of them horizontally rep represents their duration and their color represents the velocity. And if I send this out to a MIDI device that can interpret MIDI notes and play music from those MIDI notes, that device will play this song, the Canadian National Anthem. The reason we have this here, honestly, is that someone requested it and it was not that hard to add, so we added it. But I believe that this is probably the least, most often type of cue used in QLab. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some folks use it all the time. I have used it exactly once uh, in, a, in a real show, uh, but that one time was super cool, so I'm gonna talk about it. I was working on a show called Tribes, which if you have not read it, please allow me to recommend that you read it. It is a beautiful play. Um, in this play, the first act concludes with a woman playing uh, a piece of music called Claire de Lune. And uh, the actress in our production uh, was not able to play the piano or not able to play it um, very well. And Claire de Lune is not a beginner piece. Uh, so. The way that we settled this is the piano was a, a Yamaha Clavinova, which is a kind of a piano, a digital piano that it's a, it's a physical piano with a MIDI mechanism built in that actually, oh wait, no, this wasn't a Clavinova. I'm gonna take it back and I tell the story properly. We had a piano, but it wasn't a real piano. It was just the shell, the physical shell of a piano with the keyboard still attached. So you could play, but there were no strings or hammers or anything. And then we put a synthesizer in the piano and we played a MIDI file track out of QLab into the synthesizer that came out of the box of the piano. And this woman had practiced seeming as though she was playing, but the audience couldn't see her fingers. So she, as long as she gave a, a convincing physical performance uh, of playing the piano, basically down to the wrist, uh, and we played the MIDI file through the synthesizer that was built into the case of the piano, the whole effect was convincing. It's the only time I've used a MIDI file uh, in a show. 
And if I return to workspace settings, again, comma, command comma, or clicking the gear icon, and I go to MIDI, you will see that I have eight patches for MIDI queue output and eight patches for MIDI file output. And the real reason that they're separated is just that we thought it was conceivable that someone would want to have all of their MIDI queues going through some hardware and their MIDI file queues going through some other hardware. So that's why we have them separate there. Great. Ethan asks, how do time code triggers work? Uh, and that's a really broad question, so I'm going to take a second to see if there's any really quick questions after uh, and then come back to that. Um, Insane Order's got a split. Thank you and thank you. So long, Insane Order. Um, Desires said, effect said, I use the MIDI file queue in big to have the giant light up piano play along with the intermission music. I love that. Adorable. I love it. Um, um, Blake wants to know if I could talk more about black magic in our collaboration. Uh, and I certainly can. Um, so I'll talk about that just for a change of pace and then I'll go back to time code triggers. Um, uh, so our collaboration with black magic is actually not as much of a collaboration as it might seem. Um, black magic, uh, is a company based in Australia that makes, um, a wide variety of pretty groovy uh, digital video equipment that hooks up to Macs, and they provide an SDK, a software development kit, which is basically a collection of um, materials that make it possible for our development team to learn how to build QLab um, components in QLab that can communicate with Blackmagic hardware. So if I have a Blackmagic Decklink uh, audio, uh, uh, audio video ingesting gadget, plugged into my Mac, QLab can see that as an available source for camera cues. So I can plug a camera into that video ingest gadget, and then the video from that camera gets used as a cam the source material for a camera cue in QLab. QLab can also output video to Blackmagic devices, although because it's impossible to use GPU acceleration for video that goes to a Blackmagic device, it's something we don't super recommend um, because it sort of squanders the power of your computer's GPU. So it's not really a partnership and a collaboration, except as much as we once asked them a question about it and they said, oh yeah, here's how you do that. Um, it's, uh, it's something that they have decided um, to make easy for folks like us to do. Um, they wanted it to be easy for anyone to write Blackmagic hardware support into their program, and so uh, they did that, and it turns out that they succeeded. It was easy. We wrote Blackmagic support into QLab, and it wasn't such a big deal. Aja has decided to take a little bit more of a uh, gatekeeping approach. I don't think that that's fundamentally bad, but it's part of the reason why we haven't done it. Um, Ethan asked about time code triggers. Okay, so here we go, time code triggers. I'm going to create a memo queue again. No, I meant to say a wait queue. I'm going to look at the triggers tab. We talked about MIDI triggers, and we talked about hotkey triggers. The next we're going to talk about is time code triggers. Uh, time code time code is expressed in a format that looks essentially like this, and the first chunk is hours or reels, R E E L, meaning reels of film. The second is minutes, the third is seconds, and the final is frames. Um, time code has a frame rate like film because time code was invented by the film industry. So if you were working on a major motion picture in, this, uh, in cinema, you'll be working at 24 frames per second. And so that number goes up to 24 and then returns to zero and increments that number by one, which is seconds which work like real seconds. If you're working in, uh, in television, it can be 60 frames per, up, up to 60 frames per second. If you're working uh, in television in uh, North America, it can be 60 frames per second. In Europe, it's 50 frames per second because of the differences uh, in how electricity is produced in Europe versus North America. Anyway, this is a time code here. And the way that QLab responds to timecode is the following. 
if your Mac is hooked up to a device that is receiving timecode, either an audio device receiving LTC, which stands for linear timecode, or a MIDI device receiving MTC, which stands for MIDI timecode, you can trigger cues using that timecode first by selecting the cue list that your cues are in and then looking in the timecode tab of the inspector saying, yes, trigger cues in this list from timecode, telling it whether it's MIDI or linear, and then saying what the device is. If it's MIDI timecode, here will be a list of all the MIDI devices connected to your Mac. If it's linear, here's a list of all the audio devices connected to your Mac. If you choose an audio device, it couldn't be Sam's AirPods Pro because my AirPods cannot send timecode, but let's imagine. Uh, then you have to choose what channel. All right, it's only coming in on the right ear. Then you choose what format your timecode is using. Let's say I'm using 25 frame per second. Uh, forget about this for a moment. Let's say I'm using 25 frame per second timecode. Uh, then you'll see waiting until QLab hears actual timecode coming in. Then it'll let you know, okay, good, I've got timecode there. Um, if it's MIDI, you choose a MIDI device and a format. Now, you saw this, I, this happened before when I tried to change SMPTE format, the frame rate. Um, this error came up. So what's going on here is when I change what format i.e. frame rate, a cue list is going to be receiving, QLab wants to know, listen, should I keep the old, um, should I recalculate the MIDI timecode trigger for each cue within this cue list? Because changing frame rate means changing the time at which those cues will trigger. You can tell QLab to either keep the old timecodes or recalculate the timecodes. Um, if this is not something that makes any sense to you or you're not familiar with, do not worry because uh, timecode is one of, those in, one of those things where you only need to know what you've come up against and are interacting with in a practical sense. Timecode was invented so that a film camera and an audio tape recorder recording audio on a film set could be kept in sync. And since then, it's been co-opted, just the same way MIDI was co-opted, to be used for a variety of things. Um, it's irritating to work with, and um, and the fact that it's used slightly differently in cinema, in theater, in live entertainment, in corporate uh, production, makes it only that much harder to deal with. But in any case, once you have this checkbox checked and these settings set to match your physical setup, cues within the cue list can individually be set to timecode trigger. And when this timecode comes in, this cue will trigger. And that's it. That's how timecode triggers work in QLab. Next question. Uh, could you use QLab as a switcher in a Blackmagic camera system? Um, that depends on your system, right? Blackmagic has a pretty groovy um, switching sort of infrastructure that they've designed in which individual cameras can all sort of be remote controlled by their physical video switchers and their video switchers are, are very affordable compared to other video switchers with the same feature set. Um, QLab itself doesn't have any of the powers that their switchers do to remote control the cameras. So you could take several Blackmagic video input devices, plug them all into the same Mac, plug one camera into each device, and then use QLab as a video switcher by running different camera cues to bring in the video input from those different cameras. And in fact, I have done exactly that. Uh, recently, I worked on a production of a play called Frost Nixon. And uh, this play, um, this production employed four cameras on stage. Uh, two of them um, had SDI output running straight back to the booth um, into SDI video input devices. Uh, which were plugged using USB into, uh, into, I'm sorry, Thunderbolt plugged into the Mac. Then two of the cameras were plugged into wireless SDI transmitters, uh, sorry, wireless HDMI transmitters, the receivers of which were plugged into two HDMI input devices plugged into my Mac. And then the Mac could uh, uh, 
could use camera cues to bring up any of the four video input devices at any time or any mixture of them. Um, I had a pretty high powered Mac, um, or rather I had a top spec Mac mini, which is only middlingly high powered, but I had an external GPU so that rendering all this video was not happening on the internal integrated GPU in the mini, which is, um, not terrible, but not super impressive. And it worked pretty smoothly. Um, the issue here is latency because software can't switch video signals as fast as dedicated hardware. We had um, somewhere approaching a one quarter second latency uh, for some of our, vi for our video. Um, for our application, that was suitable. In fact, it was pro uh, completely unproblematic, but uh, your situation might be different. You might be unable to tolerate a quarter to a half, even a second, uh, even a half second of latency. And so uh, you have to decide whether that amount of latency is acceptable to you. And if it's not, you really need to use a hardware video switcher. It's five minutes to five, which means um, we've been almost going two hours now. So uh, I'm going to look back over the questions and see if there's anything that I missed. And if anyone has a couple of last questions, I, I invite them to please put them in um, or comments. That's also fine. Um, but I'm going to go look back and make sure I haven't missed anything because I'm going to sign off right at five. Um, so looking back quickly, uh, we talked about 088. We talked about redundant systems. Um, we talked about what programming language QLab uses, pre-show music, auto load grouping cues. Uh, someone said they were jealous of how I'm proximate to trains and um, I beg your pardon. And I, uh, I'm, I'm sorry for your jealousy and you're welcome to come visit me and hang out by the train anytime you like. Uh, we talked about auto follow and continue and post wait and pre wait. We talked about time code. We talked about having a clock on screen. We talked about bundling and folder structure. We talked about whether we hire or not. Um, and we talked about beta testing, redundant systems got talked about a lot. We talked about Aja video that, that Jake Harvey asks, do you do any merch or branded stuff? That is a great question. The answer is yes. I can't remember the address though. So we're going to find it together. There we go. Figure 53.storeenvy but with only a single E, so storeenvy.com. I'm gonna put that link in the chat. Uh, um, and, uh, and my colleague Allison just gave me clappy emojis, which I appreciate because we are a group of folks who affirm each other and that feels nice. Um, Scott says it's more than made up for SpaceX bailing this morning. <laughs> I didn't know SpaceX had something going this morning, but I am very flattered, uh, very flattered to be referred to in the same breath as SpaceX. Uh, you can think what you want about Elon Musk as an individual. Uh, he's certainly a complicated person and you can, um, think what you want about private, uh, versus public funding for space travel. I have a lot of opinions on that, but certainly I think we can all agree that what SpaceX is doing is impressive. And it's certainly interesting to watch, at least for me. Um, Jake says, thank you. Jake, you are welcome. And you are all welcome. And Gavin asks the question we get all the time. And Gavin asks, I'm sure you get this question all the time, but what are the odds of Windows compatibility? The odds are really low. And here is the answer. Um, uh, here's the answer to why. First of all, no one on our team has Windows development experience. So if we wanted to have a Windows version of QLab, we'd have to hire a bunch of folks and get them spun up building QLab. Uh, as the product manager for QLab, I can tell you that to build QLab from scratch on Windows, even with a relatively big team, is going to take at least two years. So that means that we're gonna spend two years building QLab for a second platform where we have to pay twice as many developers, but we don't get twice as many sales. So that's a problem. Then thing number two, once it comes out on Windows, uh, none of our support team has Windows experience. So we need to double the size of the support staff. So now QLab is uh, being built and supported by two 15-person teams. 
and those two teams might have to work to stay in sync. So that's extra work. Next, Windows computers have a much greater variety than Macs. So the number of situations that we need to understand and test multiplies that takes time and it takes money. And it's impossible, honestly, to test every configuration. And this is a problem that SFX, which was a, uh, is, excuse me, uh, I was gonna say was a, a, a audio software program that predates us and still exists, um, but I, it made it sound for a moment like I was saying it didn't exist anymore. That's not true. SFX is alive and well. SFX has like a narrow set of recommended configurations where it used to back when I used it um, in the SFX five days, a narrow set of recommended configurations and beyond that you were kind of on your own and we don't like the, the feeling that that gives. Uh, and then the final reason is that we're not really sure what that would accomplish because it's true that inexpensive Windows computers are cheaper than inexpensive Macs, but high performance Windows computers are relatively similar in cost to high performance Macs. And the truth is that QLab is a program that demands a high performance computer. Uh, it's not a web browser. It's not your email. It's not uh, Microsoft Word. It, it's meant to be a professional level playback tool and it needs, uh, it needs good performance. And once you get up into the high performance computer category, the price differential between Mac and PCs is close. I'm not saying it's identical, and certainly the most expensive Mac is wildly more expensive than the most expensive PC. But a good solid performer for QLab, a top spec Mac mini um, or a highly spec MacBook Pro, to get a uh, apples to apples, huh? Apples to apples equal Windows machine doesn't actually save you very much money. And so our feeling is why would we open the door to all this complexity, all this additional business risk, all this com all this uh, difficulty when all it will do is possibly save some of our customers something like 10% on the cost of purchasing a computer to run the program. That doesn't feel like a meaningful trade-off. And I'm not saying I don't wanna save our customers money, I do. And the reason that we price QLab uh, the way we do with very inexpensive rentals and with um, very inexpensive educational pricing, comparatively speaking, um, is to keep it accessible to the widest possible audience. Um, and that's where we try to save you money though, not in, in your hardware purchase. So that's my explanation. And um, uh, I don't think Windows is bad. Uh, I mean, I do, but Figure 53 doesn't. <laughs> Figure 53 doesn't have a problem with Windows and I don't have a problem with Microsoft as a company. It's not my preferred environment, speaking only for myself. It just means that um, we have to focus on what we're good at and let someone else focus on what that other person is good at. Um, you all have been wonderful. Thank you so much for your questions and, uh, and uh, your comments and your thoughts. Uh, this live stream, when we complete, um, this live stream will be converted into a, a, a regular video on our channel. So you can return to QLab.TV, which is uh, our, our YouTube channel's address, and you can follow along this uh, video with the commentary uh, in the future if you want to go back and revisit something or if you'd like to look at either of the Q&As that we did before this one. Um, please feel free to share this link. Please write to us, support at figure53.com. If you have any question, big or small, at any time, if you'd like to share an idea about what you think you'd like to see in QLab, if you'd like to ask a question about something that's going wrong, if you'd like to ask a question about something that's going right, if you want to be uh, put onto our mailing list so that you can get announcements for things like whether or not we have a new version of QLab coming out or anything like that. Um, find us on Twitter. You can find us on Instagram. You can, um, you can try finding us on Facebook, but we don't do anything there. Uh, and that's my spiel. Thanks so much for joining me today. And I hope that you all have a lovely rest of your day and take care.